Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let me just say, you guys are really sweet. I appreciate that. And to Vicky's listening, thank you very much. And Vicky knows why. Um, in the last several weeks, we have been studying the characters of the Bible, and of course, we've only been able to, to uh, talk about a few. And I thought it was interesting, early on in my study, uh, and I reviewed it this week, early on in my study, I had uh, been looking in the internet, and it wasn't for whatever Tom was looking for, that was it, right? But what, what I was looking for was uh, uh, kind of a survey to figure out of all the Bible characters, um, who is it that people, if they could go back and they could spend a day with him, who would that person be? Right? We've all seen those, those studies before. And, uh, and they're fascinating to, to, to read. They are. And uh, we've talked about some very interesting people, from Adam to last week we talked about Elisha. But without a doubt, the number one answer is always Jesus Christ. Right? Uh, Jesus Christ is the person that is the most attractive to, to believers. If they could just spend a little time with one person, that is who it would be. And, and I told you uh, in kind of prefacing this study that, that I was going to talk about Jesus and, and I was going to just talk about it in, in one class. And, and I, I warned you that uh, you, you can't cover Jesus in one class, right? Um, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, John, you recall at the end of his gospel, uh, which was all about love, thank you, Dan, right? about God's love, being the son of God and how God so loved the world that Jesus came and died for us. But the, the, the gospel ends with these words. This is the disciple who bears witness of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his witness is true. And there are also many other things with, 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 which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books which were written. Now, we've probably read that passage before, and certainly I have, but I started focusing in on that part where it says that if they were written in detail, the world itself could not contain them. When you think about the life of Christ um, and the uh, how effectual his life has been, I think that's what he's talking about with the details. I think one could probably write down his roughly 33 years of life on this earth and say, okay, the day he was born at 6 a.m. this happened and go all the way to the cross. And you could probably chronicle that. But that's not really what John is talking about. When he talks about the, it, write, to write down in detail all that Jesus did, I think what he's indicating is the, how effectual the life of Christ was. That his influence not only penetrated the individuals to whom he spoke, but it was passed on through the people to whom he spoke. To where it just it essentially affected people that... We, we cannot even fathom. And I believe this with all my heart. That book is still being written today, if it was to be written. That the world could not contain of the books to explain just how effectual the life of Christ has been. Today what I want to do is just talk about how I think we can continue that story. And that we can continue to influence the pages of books 
that will be written until the Lord returns. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, Jesus Christ in that he is eternal, all-knowing, uh, all all-powerful. Uh, I want to talk about the, the, his influence and how we, as his disciples, can continue that influence. You know, we've talked about a couple of things uh, this morning, and I want to go back. It's incredible how, I mean, yeah, the Lord is in control, but I did not know he was in, the, in control of Tommy's uh, lesson and Dan's lesson today, and how it was going to dovetail and, into what we're, we're discussing. But I just want to remind you that we are Christ's ambassadors today. Tommy talked about that, and Dan talked about that. that. That when the Spirit lives through us, that Christ gave us, that really Christ is living in us, and the works that we do are perpetuating, if you will, the work of Christ. In Romans, uh, and boy, what a tough book. And by the way, Tommy, well done, right? A very detailed, very important book for all Christians to, to, to read and, and absorb. Because it's very powerful. But you recall in Romans chapter 6 where it says, Do you not know, verse 3, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? And therefore we have been buried with him through death? Or excuse me, that we have been buried with him through baptism into death? In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, when we became Christians, we really did put the old man behind us. And we did come out of the water to walk in innocent life. And that, and that life that we live is, should be now animated through the Spirit of God uh, who, who he has given us. And, you know, again, Tommy alluded to it in class today in Romans chapter 8. And if Christ is in you through the body... Uh, or, or though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells in you. You know, we have an amazing life. We have an amazing life because... If we're being animated by the Spirit, if we've allowed Christ to dwell in us and, and, if you will, rule our lives, our life is so fulfilling. And it's truly life. You know, did you ever really live until you became a Christian in the truest sense? And, and, and uh, going on with that, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul writes there, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. It's a life of, of, of gratitude and, and, and submission out of faith to our Lord and Savior. Going on, Galatians, and, and you know, I've got my last sermon, I might get wordy, but I'm going to uh, I won't, hopefully it won't take too long. But in Galatians chapter uh, in chapter 5, it says, but talking about the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. The old man that was buried in the waters of baptism is no longer there. We now should be continually, habitually, Allowing the fruit of the, fruit of the Spirit to be displayed in our lives. We are Christ's legacy. We are additional pages to the books that are being written. Amen? Amen. So I want to just talk about a couple things that we can think about doing in our lives. That I think uh, that Jesus did, obviously. Uh, but I think are going to be equally as powerful in our day and age. And just a couple because, you know, they only give me a half an hour or so, right? right? But these things, I believe, are important, and they're things that we can do that are, I think, more important than perhaps we realize. 
The first thing that I would like to look at is, um, is that Christ was very kind. And, and he taught us to be kind. Uh, in John chapter 2, we have a story of Christ's first miracle. You remember that? It's the, it's the wedding at Cana. And uh, when, uh, well, basically, I'd like to read that for you, and then I want to go back and just touch a couple things. But I, I, right from the beginning, I want to tell you that I think this very first miracle was motivated out of kindness. Uh, and so it says there in John chapter 2, beginning verse 1, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now I just stopped it just for a moment. Uh, Apparently the situation is, this must be a family friend. Somebody who's very important to Mary. Somebody who knew Jesus, knew Jesus' disciples. And there's a wedding and they're invited. Not about you, but, um, you know, when, I, when I'm invited to a wedding, I, I feel like it's an honor. Right? That, that uh, someone thinks uh, enough of me to invite me. Well, apparently Jesus and Mary are important enough to these people. That they're invited, and uh, by the way, they're important enough to Jesus and Mary that they show up, right? What happened in this situation culturally is, you know, in this the wedding weddings, is they they one of the things they do is, of course, they provide the meal, and in this particular situation, this specific part is that they have wine, and everybody comes to the wedding feast and they drink the wine, and it's a social. It's a social statement. I mean, today, by the way, uh, I, weddings, uh, I gotta say, weddings, uh, some of them have just, <laughs> they're out of control, right? Because weddings are not just a, uh, an act, uh, a celebration of love, like Valentine's Day, but sometimes they carry much more than that. In some of these minds, it's a social event, and actually, it can affect one's, uh, how people look at you, I don't, I mean, uh, I don't, men and women are a little different, but I'll, I'll just say this, because I think it's a truism. Women are much more interested in how things go at a wedding than men. Amen? Okay? Okay? Well, in Jesus' day, there's also a social stigma that would have, been, would have been attached to a group of people who had invited people to a wedding feast. They're supposed to provide wine throughout the wedding feast. And these people ran out. And oddly, Jesus' mother comes to Jesus and says, uh, they have no wine. Think about that. It's so important to Mary that she goes to Jesus, knowing her son, and she says, son, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. She's relentless. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. <laughs> okay, this is the part of Jesus we don't think about. Jesus, basically, from what we read, says, okay, mom. It's so important to Mary that she really doesn't give Jesus a choice, so to speak. She's going to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. In other words, son, do it. And so, this happens. Now, there were six water pots there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it out to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. He turned a, a situation to where there would have been public humiliation 
for these close friends because they'd run out of wine, and he turned it exactly around. And no, now the head waiter is thinking, wow, you guys are, you served great wine, or good wine first, now you're serving great wine. See, I, I just want to point out that I believe this was an act of kindness. It was the first miracle that Jesus had performed in the next verse. Verse 11 says, The beginning of his signs Jesus did in the kingdom of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This act of kindness touched the hearts of his disciples as well as it did everybody else. It was an act of kindness. You know, when you read about Jesus' life in the Gospels, you're, you, you, you see that there are numerous acts of kindness. When he saw people that were hungry, he fed them. When he saw people who were sick, he healed them. Those with demons, he chose to cast them out. And even when he saw the broken hearts of the family of Lazarus at Lazarus' death, Jesus wept and then came to Lazarus and raised him from the dead. There is no, no kinder person to ever walk the face of the earth than the Lord in the flesh. In the flesh he came so that we would know he knows exactly how your days go. He knows exactly what humiliation is like. And he's kind. He has kindness and compassion toward that. He knows what it's like for there to be sickness. He knows what it's like to be overcome by urges and addictions and so on and so forth, and even demons. He knows what that's like. And he knows what it's like to have to suffer through the death of a loved one. And what he's saying through his life is, yes, I understand, and I'm going to show you that I do care. And he had healed and fed and cast out demons and even raised the dead. To illustrate, he understands pain and he has the answer to all of that. But he can affect that if you have faith. I think one of the most beautiful things about the gospel story is that God was willing to come in the flesh to experience us and our pain and our difficulties. And most of all, he came because he was the only one that would be able to offer the sacrifice sufficient to cleanse mankind of their sins. He's all willing to do that. Spending time with God or being equal with God was not something he, to be grasped, but he was willing actually to come here and to die for our sins. He was willing to leave that and come here because he loved us. Uh, one of the most touching things that in Scripture that uh, for me is in, in Matthew chapter 8, as far as an act of kindness. My sister has a disease called Bichette's. Bichette's is an is a autoimmune system disease, and from the time she's a young woman, it's been about 25 years or so now, um, she, uh, twice a month, her body just explodes, and she gets these <coughs> boils all over her, her her body, in the most tender areas of her body, her neck and her chest, and, and just everywhere. And uh, when Colton was a little boy, I went to go, we went to go see my, his Aunt Melody, and, uh, and she had plastic gloves on her hands, and she was making dinner, and you could see under those plastic gloves, those thin uh, latex gloves, you could see the pus oozing from the sores but she just wanted to try to cook in a clean way. And my little boy Colton, great big heart, he looked at his Aunt Melody. He walked up to hug her. Right? And I'm so proud of him. Because she didn't get that. Matthew chapter 8. It says, Jesus came down from the mountain. Large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him, bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean.
Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Think about that. He reached out and touched him. And said, I am going to be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. That is one of the most, for me, one of the most personally kind things that I've read of Jesus doing in Scripture. This person had not felt human contact in years. <laughs> Kindness is a, is a trait, a characteristic that all of us can demonstrate in our lives. It is so Christ-like. And in a world where and there is this division, so I don't want to overplay that. Kindness is never out of fashion. Kindness is always powerful. And it's how we can continue Christ's legacy. Another story I like, another characteristic, is, is Christ's <coughs> insistence on fairness and justice. Do you remember the story in John chapter 8? It says here that in verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, <clears throat> Teacher, this woman's been caught in adultery in the very act. Now the law, of Mo the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Can you imagine those pompous people saying that in front of Jesus? Could have been very people in that very room were the other offender. But Jesus says, uh, he said they were saying this, testing him so they might uh, have grounds accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him first be first to cast the stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone. And the woman, where she was, in the center of the court. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. It's a beautiful story. Jesus recognized that they were basically surrounded by hypocrites. They were basically, they self-righteous people looking at the sinful life of another and thinking, yeah, you know what? Let's punish her. Jesus, you agree? And Jesus could read their hearts. The victim. She was a sinner. Yeah, she may have been guilty. Caught in the very act. But she was as important as any of those people. More so. And after basically, I thought, and by the way, I thought it was fascinating that the older people left first. Mm -hmm. You know, a little experience there. The older we get, I think the little more tolerant we are of the sinful nature of other people because we tend to have a longer list, right? All right? This is something we have to learn, and Jesus knew it, and he wanted them to learn it. But you know what? You who are without sin cast first down. We have to be tolerant of one another. Patient when, when others sin, even against us. I love the story in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus kind of drug, kind of nails the whole compassion thing home when he's talking to another to to to, to a, another group of, of Jewish Jewish people and, and uh, he, he, they're talking about well you know who's my neighbor. And Jesus uses this opportunity to talk about the Good Samaritan. He says in verse 30 of Luke chapter 10, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and, and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, going down on that road, and when he saw him, he, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite also. When he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, 
who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, felt compassion. And came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he, he, he put him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell by the robber's hands? And he said, and, and he said, well, the one who, who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, yeah, go, go and do the same. It is good for us to be reminded that uh, we continue Christ's legacy when we are not respecters of persons, when we are not choosy about the people to whom we show compassion. You know, they, no matter what your political leaning is or whatever your socioeconomic background is, your race, your, your, your gender, or, and I would suggest to you even your, your sexual preference, everyone's, everyone is due simple compassion Jesus would teach that. He, did, he, he, he seemed to make a point that the religious elite, yeah, the priest and the Levite, they just walked by this Samaritan who was not clean, according to the Jews, or uh, this robber, excuse me, but a Samaritan who was not clean to the Jews, a man who was probably despised by the priest and the Levite, he came by and he had compassion on the victim of these robbers. Who was the neighbor? You, disciples of the law of Moses. You tell me. Who was a neighbor to this man? <clears throat> yeah, the one who showed compassion. We are the disciples of Jesus. We study the law of God. Is there anyone unworthy of the compassion of God? It's a rhetorical question. And the third thing, because the list can go on, but I'll just say the the third one, and I think this is very important, is, you know, Jesus was, not only was he kind, and not only was he really diligent about showing compassion to everybody, but, you know, he spoke the truth. You remember John chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, it says, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. Truth is very important to Jesus. And what he says about the truth is the truth has the potential of making them free. Now remember uh, a story Jesus had, uh, was talking to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12. And these Pharisees, uh, these Pharisees were having a problem with Jesus. And uh, bottom line is he recognized that these men were, had, had ulterior motives. And he, he wanted to confront them with the truth of who they were. And we talked about Jesus being kind and compassionate. but And I believe he is here too when he says this in Matthew chapter 12, beginning of verse 34. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of what, of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out evil treasure for what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. See, what happened earlier was Jesus actually had performed a miracle. And they said, well, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, by the devil. And Jesus said, here, you know what? You need to understand this. You brood of vipers. You got to be careful what you say. Because those words that you say reflect on what's really going on in your heart. He's confronting them with the truth of where their heart was. They couldn't have compassion on Jesus, casting out this demon, having compassion on the man for whom, to whom the demon had been cast out, 
And they're using this as an opportunity to what? To say, now he's doing that. It's a, by the power of Beelzebub? They needed to hear that. Again, they needed to hear that. Sometimes telling the truth is a, is a kindness. It is, a, it, is a, it is an act of compassion. Thank you, by the way, for the story. I'm talking to Sister Slater. Right? Sometimes it's best just to say what is the truth. Sin is sin. And sin can cost somebody their soul. And rather than just for a temporary pat on the back to be told, oh, you know what? You're woke. It's better maybe to have some thinking about the eternal destiny of the person you're speaking to. And that's hard. That is hard. But folks, we have to learn to speak the truth. Jesus even when it was painful, even when it was difficult, Jesus always spoke the truth. And we need to know that that's part of his legacy that should live through us. The key to it is, I know Jesus spoke those words out of love. Right? John chapter 8, verse 32. Remember, you will know the truth. The truth will make you free. Truth is important. You've got to come to the realization that you're a sinner before you can realize you need a Savior. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, talking about the church, I think, you know, in earlier, he gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some, some teachers, right? And he starts talking about how important it is for us to have good, sound teaching and leadership within a local congregation, how everybody needs to be a part of that. And going down to verse 14, he says, as a result, we are no longer what? We are no longer children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery, trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all the aspects of the him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. See, when I'm reading Ephesians chapter 4, and he starts talking about he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, and that's supposed to be beneficial for us. And then he introduces this idea, but speak the truth in love. I get the idea. He's telling me, church leaders sometimes are going to say things that are going to be convicting to me. And sometimes we have a, a need to speak to one another, and sometimes it's going to be convicting to us. And so he very wisely tells us, but remember, you speak the truth in love. That is an important part of the recipe for growth of the individual and of the body. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through me, right? Truth is so important. Kindness is important. And it's uh, across the board compassion for our fellow man, very important. But speaking the truth is very important because it is motivated out of kindness and compassion and love for other people. And we live in a day and an age now where that may not be woke. But it's, but it's Christ. It's Christ. You know, I think about the people that I've if I could pick anybody in historical time to spend time with, not just a Bible character, and you guys know me well enough to know where I'm going with this, you know, because it's just me. I'd want to spend time with my great-grandma Johnson, right? Just the way it is. And, and, uh, but then I started thinking, why is that? Why am I so, uh, why do I love that woman so much? And I'm convinced it's because she's the most Christ-like woman ever in my family. So sacrificial, so kind, patient, 
all of those wonderful things. Boy, you know what? People who spent time with her, it seems like they were spending time with Christ. And I want to tell you, then I realized, and I told my wife this this, this last week, I couldn't have married anyone more like my grandma Johnson. Happy, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and I know Zach's over there going, Frank, now what did you do? <laughs> but I think that's the point that I, that I guess I'd like to close on. Because you know what? I think if your family, your family should every day be able to say what I say, and that is that, you know what? I think I'm spending time with Christ every day when I wake up next to my wife. Right? And I hope she feels the same with me, about me. And I, I think that's probably the best honor that we can give our Lord. Because, again, going back to Johnson, back here, John said there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books which were written. Folks, we are still writing the books. The details are still there. And we can all do our part. And uh, God's holding the library. Okay, but let's just do our part. Let's uh, let's allow people to see Christ living in us. That is our lesson today. Please bow with me. That's the Lord and Father. We're so very grateful for your Word and for learning about your Son and all that He did for His creation. And uh, we're grateful that He taught people that have taught others, that have taught others, so that we in our generation have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us strength and uh, courage and, and love to, uh, to understand how important it is that we carry on that legacy and that we allow people to see the life of Jesus living in us. Help us to be kind and compassionate to all. Help us to love people enough to be able to live out of love, motivated by love, speak the truth, and help them to come to an understanding that they need a Lord and Savior, and those that become disciples of Jesus, that we remind them that they need to continue to live for Him and be animated by the Spirit of God. We're thankful for this church and the encouragement we receive from one another, and we pray your, your blessings upon us this week as we go out. And we try to influence those that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 That is our lesson today. We thank you for tuning in from home and for being here. And just make this a great day for yourself and for the Lord. Thank you.